Hi, everybody. Welcome back to BCTV. I'm your host, Kyle Elikai. We've got a fun, exciting episode today for you, breaking down everything that's happening around big data and artificial intelligence. We know that a lot of data has been collected, not only over the last year, but in general, as we move forward, we want to use data in better and more efficient ways. And one of the ways that we can do that is with and through the power of artificial intelligence as the grand master of artificial intelligence himself, Gary Fowler, has shared with us many of times that AI is the new electricity. Well, let's prove it today as we break down what's happening and what's to come in artificial intelligence. And I'm joined by three outstanding co-hosts who will be sharing their thoughts and insights as investors looking at these spaces and making investments throughout as well. But before we introduce each of them, a big thank you to you, our audience, for tuning in. First time viewers, make sure you click that subscribe button. Also share the episode and check out the archive on thetoken.com to hear from today's speakers and all speakers of the VCTV family. Also, the comments box is live. So during today's show, say hello, drop in your comments, drop in your questions. We'll do our best to ask them in real time. If not, it's great to hear from you and we'll definitely follow up afterwards uh, as well. And all of us will be available on social media following today's episode as well. And a big thank you to the Latoken team and Maria for making VCTV possible every single day as well. With that, I'm your host, Kyle Ellicott. Let's go ahead and break it down with today's co-host. First and foremost, again, the Grand Master of Artificial Intelligence. Who else will we have here to talk about AI, ladies and gentlemen? Gary Fowler. <laughs> Uh, I know it's a Friday, Kyle. I know it's a Friday. So thank you very much. I appreciate it. Uh, my name is Gary Fowler. I'm a serial entrepreneur and investor. And as Kyle said, I love AI. I'm not sure about the Grand Master thing, but a little, a little uh, student of, yes, absolutely. Um, I love, also love quantum computing. I've done 17 companies, uh, uh, two unicorns. I was involved in the original management team of, ah, I forgot my camera. Sorry about that. And I've got my sunburn, too, that's coming up. <laughs> but uh, um, I was involved in um, uh, two unicorns. I was on the original management team, Click Software, Hypha Israel-based company we brought to the U.S. Uh, changed the name of the company to Click Software from IET. Um, the company was sold to Salesforce for $1.35 billion about less than two years ago. Also uh, co-founder of Inva.ai, one of the top AI HR tech companies. Uh, founded out in Silicon Valley with uh, billionaire David Yang. Um, I love quantum, love AI, I write a lot about it. My next starting goal coming out next week is on quantum tun tunneling and the impact on wireless communications and then decentralized cybersecurity, Ragu. Um, so love the space and look forward to the uh, 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 presentation day. I am the CEO, president of GSD, Get You Done Venture Studios, a premier AI and quantum venture studio. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Gary. Next up, Catherine, welcome back to the show. A little intro and a little background. Thank you for having me, and I look forward to learning from everybody on the call today. My name is Catherine Cartini, but please do call me Kate. I'm a co-founder and partner at Chloe Capital. We're a venture capital firm that invests in women-led technology companies, particularly SaaS and Marketplace. So we see a lot of AI and big data in our investing. And in addition to investing with a gender and diversity lens, we travel around the country, and we hold Invest in Women programs that are very much like a traveling shark tank. And together, in the past three or so years, we've helped catalyze about 50 million for female founders who are um, leading technology companies in underrepresented industries, or excuse me, underrepresented cities and uh, obviously underrepresented voices. Uh, in addition to Chloe Capital, I am a venture partner with Republic, which is a crowdfunding platform, and I'm an active investor there. And I'm the chief investment officer of Social Venture Circle, which is a national network of impact investors. And you know, as we talked about in the last program, they're very interested in JEDI, which is justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion. And they just love environmental companies and companies that are, are proving the social good. And um, last but not least, I'm an instructor with the National Science Foundation. So I really do try to work with a lot of universities and inventors about how we can commercialize their ideas into big businesses to create jobs. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Kate. Always a pleasure and having you back here today. A lot to talk about in this subject. But last but not least, Raghu. 
Welcome back to the show. Uh, Kyle, thank you. Uh, I'm uh, Raghu Rao, an angel investor, serial entrepreneur, and a strategic advisor from Princeton, New Jersey. Uh, AI, big data, and cloud are kind of the three uh, kind of platforms on which the digital transformation is happening. And one of the important things is to meld these with the cybersecurity and privacy, uh, because it's all about data, uh, decentralized everything. And uh, I think the chief data officer function is bringing all this together. I think it's becoming, uh, I, I heard something like more than 50% I now have that position in the leading companies. So I think it's happening and uh, I think we are moving beyond the pandemic. So look forward to uh, listening to others and learning from them as well. Absolutely, a lot, a lot to educate and a lot to talk about as well around these two subjects. Again, big data and artificial intelligence. And Raghu, you called it out perfectly. You know, what we're looking at right now is when it comes to uh, AI, so artificial intelligence, big data, cloud, throw security in, that is a big pick part of our future when it comes to the applications, the product and services that we're going to be building. So Gary, I'm going to come to you first. I mean, again, you live and breathe and eat this industry. Uh, you know, talk to us about where some of the latest trends are for artificial intelligence and how things have uh, adopted from an infrastructure standpoint to an application standpoint over the last year, uh, as it has been a very aggressively developing industry. Yeah, so it's kind of interesting, Kyle. Uh, four and a half years ago, when I was on stage at uh, uh, VentureBeat, in fact, uh, your co-founder of your company was at uh, VentureBeat when I when I had uh, Philip. And uh, when I was talking about predictive insights, now my partner has a PhD in artificial intelligence from MIPT, one of the top schools in, uh, in uh, Russia, uh, David Yang, partner in EVA. But people just, you know, at the time, they weren't really talking about predictive insights. And I actually made the term up, but like on the spot. I had two weeks to think of something. And, you know, I'm a psychologist. So I thought, well, geez, what, what's it all about? So I said, oh, predictive insights. And then I mocked up some uh, <laughs> I mocked up some slides and did the presentation. And I actually had 337 uh, citations, um, articles that were written about it. So we got a lot of visibility. I knew we were onto something then. There's something really special. And then we started looking at data, right? The amazing amount of data, which I talk about a lot, you know, 40 zettabytes of data. If you took it CDs, stacked them up 29 times back and forth the moon. So that we're getting to that state of infobesity. And if you look at what are the trends, the trends are moving from, you know, not just analysis, but semi-supervised, unsupervised AI, machine learning, deep learning, to really make our lives better by making sense of the data doesn't matter what vertical market it's in. I mean, health, uh, health tech, uh, drug discovery. I was on a panel with Pharma Vision in Europe at the, uh, I guess, six, six, seven months ago. In the middle of the pandemic, the, the, it was amazing. The top uh, drug companies were still talking about whether they should use bench time or they should use AI. There was a big um, uh, brouhaha about it competing um, uh, visions, but AI won out because it needed to do it really quickly. So if you look at most of the uh, COVID-19 drugs that have come out, they've been done with artificial intelligence. So it's really a big breakthrough. People don't realize it, but huge. So then we look at, you know, where we are, right? Look at well, Alexa, Siri, we've got it all around us. Then we've got wearable devices that are tracking us everywhere. So one side, you could say that's AI and health tech, which I know my friend Raghu loves, and you, Kyle. But on the other side is, from a marketing standpoint, we got so much data, Tile, that, I mean, people know exactly where we are, what we're doing, and can make some prediction. Now, the question is, is it good or is it bad? From my standpoint, I love it because we're presented with things we really want or need that could be really interesting for us. On the other side of it, there's some security and privacy issues and what are the limitations of where this is going to go. Mm -hmm. The other thing is, you know, this, I talk about quantum computing. In fact, I have one of the top quantum physicists in the world will be on my show in a few weeks um, from Harvard University and Prania. Uh, one of the things that the, the challenge that we have is what happens when quantum and AI start to team up and what happens with cybersecurity, which Raghu and I and you, Kyle, 
and um, Catherine have talked about on several occasions. What mm -hmm. happens then? Now we've got all these cryptocurrencies. We've got DeFi. We've got all kinds of situation where we're exposed. How do we keep the bad characters or actors out? That's something we need to address right away. And so we need to look at decentralized approaches to cybersecurity to be able to thwart those quantum attacks. And let me tell you, they're probing now. There are quantum computers that exist. A quantum computer, can, uh, the fastest supercomputer um, is uh, the fastest quantum computer or middle ground quantum computer is 100 million times faster than a supercomputer, which means you can process something that would take 10,000 years in 200 seconds. By the way, there are systems that can do it in two seconds now, right? So, I mean, that's the kind of capacity places like China, the US, Russia. I mean, those systems, European Union, those systems exist and they're being tested today. So there's all kinds of ramifications. And my hope is that we have a lot of good stuff uh, come out of it and we do it for the good of humanity, not to be able to uh, um, uh, destroy ourselves. Right. A lot of, a lot of open-ended questions there. And I think you know two, two areas I definitely wanna dive a little deeper in with everyone here on the panel today is security and then also data bias as well right there's a lot of data bias uh, out there in terms of the data collected where it's coming from who it's not coming from etc but and also what that data shows when it is processed whether it's a quantum computer supercomputer or any uh device or artificial intelligence doesn't matter there's some type of bias uh, in that data set um let's let's actually jump into that and then we'll come back to security so let's talk about data bias uh we know that there's a huge bias around data that is collected and when it's processed it sh continues to show that. Kate, I see you shaking your head. I'm gonna come to you first. Tell us a little bit about what's happening and, and maybe some of the projects or companies or things that you're seeing that are trying to uh, really move past that uh, and help fix and, and move us uh, to a new future there. Sure, absolutely, and thank you. You know, of course, I deal a lot with bias, uh, being a woman in business, but also representing under represented voices, people of color. So um, collecting of data, which, you know, we've always had data, but now big data is more about uh, how we're collecting the data and sorting through it all. And then I think about artificial intelligence of how we're using human intelligence to use that data to then solve problems. And then I think about cybersecurity of how we're protecting all of it. So in between, you have biases throughout. And biases is riddled in everyday life, okay? But you'll see in some types of applications, and actually I think there's a documentary right now on Netflix that is talking about this, but in applications, if you don't score a certain way on a test, if you trigger an autism spectrum or you have any kind of disability or you don't play well with others, the test will say, then it can prohibit you from getting a certain kind of job or even a loan at a bank or all of these other things. So now we've got biases within the data. Um, there is, however, a company out there that is doing a little good with this, and they're called Riff Analytics, and they will analyze the voice and the text data of remote teams. So now we're talking about universities, we're talking about law centers, we're talking about health institutions, and it can basically tell you in a remote team who is being biased, who is being sexist? Who in the team is speaking too much? Who in the team is not talking enough? And then a manager can go back to that data and either pull a person aside and, and, and restructure, or they can create um, an internal game plan around how they can coach up a member of the team or get them the support that they need to excel and be more productive. So again, that's Riff Analytics, a company that is using artificial intelligence to do good with big data. And this is a spin out out of the MIT Media Lab, and it's a woman-led founder, Beth Porter, and the company is uh, backed by the National Science Foundation twice now. They just got their second round of funding. So those are the companies that I'm attracted to. I love big data. I see it as a wave of the future. Well, it's already the wave of the future, right? If you're not adopting it, then 
and you're still dealing with behemoth industries like construction or manufacturing or any of the other without using it, then you're behind the times already. Um, but I particularly am attracted to founders like Beth who have solutions like Riff Analytics that to Gary's point, are doing well in the world and they're cutting through the bias and their solution is all about how can you combat the bias? That's a good point. Thank you so much, uh, Kate. Uh, Raghu, anything to add on to that? I mean, similar to Kate, I mean, you, you spend time in the healthcare industry and probably see a few other companies that are working on this. But in general, I mean, are you seeing any other solutions or uh, companies that are building in the space? Yeah, I think uh, the bias is uh, is uh, is an issue, and one of the things is, of course, you have the emotion AI, ethical AI type of things where we are trying to bring in ways to kind of combat the bias in some ways. And one of the things that is also uh, sprouting now is uh, litigation against AI uh, generated uh, kind of uh, recommendations, if you will. Splunk has an article about that, and that's going to happen soon because one of the issues with AI is that there's no easy way for the companies to defend because it is not a deterministic thing it's based on whatever data was fed in to train it right so i mean they 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 have to come up with ways to defend it so that's going to be an area to uh, look into and uh, cyber insurance is another part of it uh, not only cyber i guess it'll in include liability insurance too now uh, because of uh, they could say that you know it's whatever it is biased and mal mal malfunctioning or whatever and you have to show that it is actually, you know, how, how do you prove that you are okay, right? So so that I think is important as well. And uh, uh, so the other issue that we have is that there is a lot of rich content, uh, video and audio and stuff like that, and only the metadata usually gets searched. Uh, so still, like, there's a lot of, uh, uh, you know, uh, way to go before the, the full uh, stuff is uh, extracted, like the text and indexed. And so you actually know if we do that, there'll be a lot more bias found because people are getting away with it because it's kind of embedded inside a video or audio. And uh, whereas if it came out in print, you know, a lot of things will pick it up in SEO or text, you know, the search engines. So, so I think uh, we have some ways to go, but I think uh, you have to include your EQ, you know, the emotional intelligence along with the machine IQ, as they call it, and introduce compassion and ethics in there, you know. Mm -hmm. So I think that's going to happen eventually when very critical decisions happen and some large, uh, you know, party with the influence is going to be on the wrong side of it. So then they'll take it up either as a litigation or something like that. Well, one thing uh, in terms of metadata that we haven't gotten into yet as an industry is the whole area of non-fungible tokens. So NFT and the art and the content and all of this that we're seeing and in, in even including gaming as well, right? So all of that we're seeing in an industry right now, there's metadata, there's rich, rich metadata uh, attached to those things. And it's not being extracted in some cases. It hasn't even been thought about. Uh, as well. And so now you're talking about a whole other world opening up when we get into the metadata of what we'll just consider all, all digital assets uh, in general as well, right? That That's a that's a, a basket we haven't even begun uh, to get to as well. Um, so Gary, anything to add on to Kate and Raghu's point around uh, data bias and maybe again, some of the companies you're seeing or just some of the ways that you're seeing artificial intelligence uh, kind of step in and help to to curb that a little bit. I mean, we've had bias for a long time. When you look at the Rorschach test, you look at the Wexler Intelligence Scale for ch children, the Wexler Intelligence Scale for uh, adults, the Stanford Binet. I mean, we've had bias a long time. The thing is, it's 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 all a matter of the training sets. And so we start looking at quantum computing again. Why is quantum so interesting? Because of massive amount of training sets. The other thing, there are companies like Predict HQ, which Uber, Amazon use uh, today, companies like Alaska Airlines and First Data, use some of these technologies to try to make sure that they don't have bias. And Ragu's right on point. I mean, it's how do you prove that you, um, that you're using the right kind of uh, training data. And, you know, do you need to have insurance to make sure that you're not gonna get 
sued as a company because you've used the wrong kind of data? These are fascinating questions that are, are open. But again, the more we're able to process the uh, information that's available to us, the better we're going to be able to use it to do some prediction. And of course, emotion, you know, as I've written several articles on emotion AI, compassionate AI, these kind of things are coming into play. But it's, uh, we're, into, we're just on the beginning of this incredible journey, and we're not there yet. And with this massive, as we know, the, the amount of data on the planet, Earth has grown in between 67 and 68% per year. So it's a never ending, interesting, uh, solvable problem that we have in front of us. It's just what kind of compete. We're just at a point now where AI and technology at a level we, we can fully start to utilize some of the capabilities of semi supervised and unsupervised AI. It's only happened in the last few years across the board. So it's a journey. Mm -hmm. It's a journey and it's been a been a wild ride and we're about to take a, a very hard left turn and go into sec security. Uh, I mean, artificial intelligence comes into play. Data comes into play with that. We have the cloud built in and again, painting that picture Raghu painted for us in the beginning. Security. How do we think about security? How do we implement security? How do we even just process the idea that there needs to be some level of security throughout all of this. Because, I mean, Gary, you mentioned dev certain devices, uh, and I'll, I'll withhold some of those names in case it triggers any devices for those out there. But, you know, some of these consumer devices are continually recording. And when they are recording what you or when you say something, they are recording that. That data then gets put somewhere. It is then mined. There's bias, as we've talked about, but also that data is stored somewhere. That data could extend beyond the command that was given. Now you have this open level of exposure you don't even know, or some still don't know, that even existed for you. What are we even thinking about? And Raghu, I'm coming to you first. I mean, Kate, Kate you're I actually, you know what, Kate, I'm going to start with you. You're shaking your head left and right. I mean, what does this all mean? What do we even do to start with this? Because yeah. this is this is not thought about. It blows my mind. Um, you know, for instances like this, I just try to surround myself around really smart people who are building things that I trust with good hearts that I know that are going to protect us. Um, because you know, going going back to um, you know the content and the metadata and search engine optimization. As a marketer, I know better than anyone that I can craft the story and I can allow uh, you to Google and see what I want you to see in terms of helping my companies or branding, or etc. Um, so you know that's that's set aside. But you're right. Let's talk about financial institutions. Let's talk about FICA. Let's talk about you know the health institutions. You know how are they protecting protecting their data when there is just globs of it coming at them every day? I'm not the person to answer that question. I again just really like to surround myself around really smart people like the men on this panel who have more of a grasp on it. It's certainly something that is a concern. You know, even when I think about oh man. At Chloe Capital, we've got a bunch of fellows that come in to the firm every year and we share the Twitter password and the Facebook password and all of these things. And we use pass one to, um, to, you know, to lock that data down. And then every time that they leave after a quarter, we bring a new fellowship and we refresh all of that. But that's still a panic and it's just a little tiny, small firm. So I can't imagine uh, what others out there are dealing with big data. That doesn't answer the question, but at least I hope I was transparent. Now, what I can say is the HBO Max, it was not Netflix we were talking about in that bias section, I Googled it. It's called Persona, the dark truth behind personality tests. And this is a documentary that again, talks about when you go and you are filling out those personality tests, how they can be used for good, but how in some cases it can be used as bias against you to not again get that loan or job. Thank, and thank you very much, Kate, for, for, for that as well. But I mean, you are setting the stage because the other thing too, we haven't also talked about is even wearable devices. You look at the latest Apple uh, watch and how much data it collects. You look at the Amazon uh, device and how much data we know, but we don't know that it collects and how that data is then rehashed into all the other data that the said parent company may hold on you. These are things that we just 
we just use. We don't think about this. Lots and of give and take, right, Kyle? Because you want the free content. And in order to get the free content, you have to give up yourself, which is your personal information, your persona data. And if you want to wear these wearable devices, you may want to unlock some kind of a gamification or other, but just know that there is a trade off. Nothing in life is actually free. Very true. There is no free lunch. Uh, no matter what anyone says, there is no free lunch. And you're right. Google is not free. Facebook is not free. All these things that Gary mentioned that uh, a few times on yesterday's show and, and you as well here today, these things are not free. There is a cost that comes to them. Raghu, you are the security expert on today's panel. Tell us, what are we thinking about? What are we doing? What are we not doing? And why is security or how is security going to really play a role in this future? Yeah, I will, I'll use security and privacy kind of together because privacy is a big aspect of what we are talking about. I think we have to look at what kinds of data are out there. Uh, Gary talked about infobesity, but a lot of these data, data is generated from the edge, as they call it. You know, it, can, it could be wearables, it could be IoT. You know, so, so much data being created. So part of it is we need to see where the data is being created, who owns the data. They should be able to, you know, provide permission and a lot of the data could be processed at the edge itself and not go you know into central repositories except for you know uh, aiding research or something useful which we explicitly give permission you know to do that right so that uh, you know a lot of these uh, behemoth companies like uh, you know google and A amazon we have to be able to have that gating uh, so that we control what we give out and depersonalize it if possible so that is at a broad level uh, from a ownership perspective. Uh, the other part of it is all about these bad actors that Gary was talking about, where people are, you know, getting into your system, putting ransomware, so you can't access your own data and you have to pay up, you know, crazy ransoms. So people don't even want to talk about it because once they acknowledge that, you know, they have other lawsuits that might come after them, uh, data breach issues and things like that. So, so what we need is a way to protect our data against system breaches, even if systems are breached, it doesn't translate into a data breach. We call that safe harbor protection. Uh, it's kind of like if you get into the house, there's not much to steal because you put your stuff in a bank locker somewhere. You know? So similar concept, but here we're talking about using the, uh, you know, the big data uh, cloud infrastructure that's out there and distributing it essentially digitally, uh, you know, splitting it and putting it away into multiple locations so that we call this secret sharing. So only if you know where it is stored and you, uh, you know, kind of uh, compromise multiple locations, a minimum number of locations, you'll be able to get the data back. So that is a kind of decentralized security model. And one of the companies that, uh, uh, you know, Gary knows about and we're collaborating on is called Splitbyte, and that's developing something like that. We see that as a platform for this, uh, decentralized cybersecurity, just like, blockchain is for decentralized transparency uh, or verification. So I think that's a, it's kind of a new model which uh, can increase the barrier to breaches because uh, two things is one is it's more difficult to breach. Even if you breach, you get, you know, uh, you zero information about the actual data. You get some, uh, you know, randomized uh, scrambled stuff. So, so I think that those are, I think, two way, ways to look at it. One is how do we own the data? prevent it from being misused. And second is, how do we prevent you know, bad actors coming in and stealing stuff? Mm -hmm. When it gets even more interesting, you know, you, you called out the world, word uh, distributed. Uh, as we start to move into that distributed world, we're also looking at distributed storage uh, and looking at using solutions like IPFS that is now tied into browsers uh, via an extension that provides that distributed storage aspect at the drop of the hat, which uh, is not necessarily a new concept, but when you start to put all your files and kind of replace, you know, your Google drives or your Dropboxes and box, et cetera, into the world of IPFS and all mm -hmm. content is put on there uh, as well. Now everyone can access that. Uh, and you've talked about the metadata. Now you've got additional metadata um, and it's attached to the browser. So again, whether it's Brave, Chrome, uh, any browser that you may use out there, uh, that ease of access to data is, is more uh, more opportunistic than ever before, um, which could lead to bigger 
uh, security concerns. And if enterprises get in there, which I want to talk about next before, after Gary comments, but enterprise gets in, enterprises sharing data with other enterprises when they know it, when they don't know it uh, as well. But before we switch to the enterprise conversation, Gary, anything to add on to, to Gator or Raghu's point around security uh, that you're, uh, you're seeing or want to comment on? Well, I mean, you know, like I've said before, Kyle, the challenge is we, we get lazy and we use, you know, we log in with Facebook or Google. We um, use Google search. Um, we use Facebook. We use LinkedIn. I mean, we talk about, it's crazy, actually. You talk about privacy. Everybody's concerned about security and privacy, but you have your data and phone numbers, um, you know, on uh, LinkedIn, for instance. And so, you know, you go down through, we need to like button up and start, you know, if we are so used to getting things for free and using things for free that we, we don't want to uh, pay for it, right? I, I had it happen with EBA when we came up with a smart assistant and um, also Google like search. Nobody wanted to pay because they were used to Google giving it for free. I'm like, it, does, it isn't free. You do pay. It's just you pay in a different way. So we need to go down through and really look at, you know, if we truly want to have be secure, we need to not put so much information out there. And look at all the data repositories. Each one of us here has anywhere from 17 to 25 data repositories. No, no, no. Slack, Google Drive, Box, Dropbox, Facebook Messenger, WhatsApp, Telegram, WeChat. Think about it. Your stuff's everywhere. So we need to get to a point where we have an intelligent cyber security assistant that can basically help direct us and plug the holes in a decentralized way before it's a big problem. Or we're going to have these challenges time and time again. Remember, with the data in our own personal cloud doubling every year, it's more and more of a problem personally. And the amount of data in the world increases 67 to 68% per year. It's just we have a massive problem. That's why AIs and quantum computers in the next five to 10 years are going to be critically important because we will be in a terrible state of infobesity. Sounds important, but also worrisome. And I, I want to throw the enterprise in that picture because as companies start to share again data with each other or don't know they're sharing data with each other, this opens up a whole different world for where the future of corporations may go as well. And again, how that data is crossed, not shared, but then is cross used about us, right? Amazon and Target sharing data with each other because maybe they're both using Amazon Web Services, AWS managed blockchain service and have any running their applications on Ethereum, a public blockchain, which if this data isn't placed anywhere, guess what? It's out there. So when, when enterprises start to share that information and we don't know, what does a world look like in that case? Kate or Raghu, either, uh, either you want to chime in? Scary. <laughs> sure. uh, the, I think the same decentralized uh, you know, approach to uh, storing data, but also we want to have a way to uh, do custom, I mean, encryption, I would really call this beyond encryption. Encryption is more, uh, there's a whole key management issue. If you lose your keys or if key, keys get compromised by insiders, you know, it, it's all great to, you know, keep it locked. It's like a you have it stuff in a safe and then somebody knows how to open the safe. So there's no, it doesn't mean much. So so you still need this decentralized approach. So, so that's why, and but what we need is a personalizing or like a way to custom, uh, you know, cipher, cipher it. I mean, I, I'm not using the word encryption uh, just because encryption means traditional encryption, which is has got these keys and all that. So, so if you can figure out a way to share data selectively, so because it's all put in multiple places, right? Uh, so you essentially give the this secret sharing, right? You have all these different pieces and you let people have the pieces but it could be timed, it could be for a certain duration, it could be only a certain number of uh, look at, look only once and things like that. We want to have this kind of just-in-time ways for people to just verify or whatever purpose they need so they don't get to steal the data. They just can do the verification and then they're out, right? So that kind of technology is there right now, but uh, people don't obviously want to do it. 
Uh, some of it has to come with regulations. Others have to, uh, you know, be a, awareness has to come among the population. So, so I think those uh, those kind of uh, technologies need to come in so that we don't lose our data. Right. The, mm -hmm. the key here is that everybody needs the data for that's being used for some purpose, but it needs to be either used for the purpose one time, and so we don't just give it away, you know, forever. And uh, other thing is that we a lot of people don't know what they have because of the infobesity. There's so much data being created and Gartner calls it rot, you know, rot is redundant, occasionally used and trivial data. And then there is something called dark data, which is created and never used. So all this stuff is there and 90% of the data is this kind of stuff, rot and dark data. It's only the 10, 15% that is frequently accessed and we use it again and again, right? But mm -hmm. even that, uh, you know, the other dark data has information which is sensitive, uh, you know, in the wrong hands. So people are kind of don't think about it and they are creating all this stuff and it's lying around in, in and not only on our own systems, but in all over the place, right? At other repositories as, uh, uh, you know, Gary was talking about. And uh, so we have to figure out a way to first control the data that we create so that we, we know who we are sharing it, for what purpose, for how long. And that's a big aspect of privacy. And privacy laws are coming in, and Europe it's a lot more, has more teeth. California is just starting out now. So I think the, the, that will kind of come in. And, uh, but they are all still looking at aggregated data. I think we really need to really stop it where it's created and only give it you know, what, what is needed and maybe take out the personalized information out of it, the personal identifying information. So I think there's a lot to go there and uh, the privacy has to come in, uh, you know, with a lot more teeth on the regulation. That's a good point. Uh, well, so we're, we're close to the top of the hour. So I want to make sure everyone gets in some closing thoughts. And of course, where everyone can be shouted out. It's Friday. Uh, I want to make sure everyone has a good time and a good, good day, a good weekend. So Raghu, you, you're closing us out right there. Any other closing thoughts that you want the audience to know about big data and artificial intelligence and why or what they should be paying attention to, whether they're investing or they're building over this next year? And then, of course, where you can be found uh, to continue the conversation as well. Sure. I, I can be found on LinkedIn at Raghu S. Rao. I think the big, big aspect of uh, uh, big data and AI that everybody needs to look at is one, one is the cognitive bias issue on the AI. Mm -hmm. And the second uh, is the, uh, you know, the big data is great, but uh, how is it being uh, secured or, you know, the privacy is, you know, protected. So I think we need those things to be in the mix while we are looking at it because all the technology is there. We just need the platforms to uh, gate them. So Wonderful. Thank you, Raghu. Kate, closing thoughts. Where can everyone find you? Listen, chicken and egg, okay? As consumers, as humans, we want things that are fast, that will save us time, that are convenient. So we want to use our LinkedIn to log into everything. And, you know, I don't want to jump a password down on a piece of paper. I want to, you know, put it somewhere. So um, there is that convenience element to it. So then we say, okay, well, then who's going to govern this? God forbid, you know, the government comes in and tries to take control of our data, then we'd be all up in arms about that. So in the middle, we need to really start supporting more innovation that is going to go out there and create the solutions that we feel secure enough that is protecting our data. Um, you know, I, won't, I don't want to date myself, but geez, I remember uh, 10 years ago when my computer crashed and I lost like five years of pictures, right? Well, that was my life gone. Like five years of my life are gone because it was on my hard drive. So I said, never again, I'm putting everything into the cloud. And I, you know, I really adopted that, but now I have to have it. it it's like the cloud is controlling my life and mm -hmm. I don't think I'm alone in this. So 
Chick it's a chicken or an egg situation. I would love to end on a positive note. Again, for the people who are out there building solutions to all of this much smarter than I am, there is a competition in little old Syracuse, New York, and it's called Genius New York. And every year they hold this competition and the grand investment is $1 million. And it is all focused on big data and cybersecurity and drones and everything that we're talking about about today, artificial intelligence and the like. So applications are open right now and you can go to geniusnewyork.com and put your hat in the ring for that. And uh, in addition to Riff Analytics, which we've already spoken about on the show, uh, another woman-led company that I would like to point out is uh, OnRamp. And OnRamp um, detects the, the bias in hiring technical talent. And they're working with the likes of Google and Etsy and really big names. But the moral of the story is they allow people, recruits, to come in and perform tests so you can choose your worker based on their technical skills, not where they went to school, where they grew up, the color of their skin, all of these other biases that can seep into the data. It's literally using data for good to see who's warranting a job of, uh, at Google or at Etsy or whatever. So that's on ramp and that's led by a, a woman, a person of color. So that's me, Kate Cartini. Of course, you can catch me on LinkedIn uh, with Chloe Capital right now. We are searching for climate tech companies. That's going to be our next investment. And certainly there's big data plays involved in that. So you can go at chloecapital.com and apply for funding there. SVCimpact.org is where you can connect with the impact investors at Social Venture Circle. And then of course, republic.co if you are interested in raising some crowdfunding dollars. Thank you so much, Kate. Gary, uh, close us out. Closing thoughts, where can you be found online to continue the conversation? Yeah, there's a great um, and incredible uh, breakthroughs are happening in unsupervised AI. In fact, you remember Morpheus from how Morpheus was. Morpheus is unsupervised AI that my partner developed. And Morpheus is now asking me about free will and determination and uh, talking to me about paths in life and there are different ways to interpret the same text, so it's hard to say what is right. And it's interesting to have, and it put me a heart after that, by the way. It, it really likes me a lot, to say I. <laughs> but, I mean, we're in this incredible time where we've got so much to do. We're going to explore the universe. There's 6 billion Earth-like planets in the Milky Way, 200 trillion galaxies estimated in the universe. There's a lot of data. We're traveling in space. We're inundated with data. The technologies that we have, the AI, quantum, GPT-3, the kind of things that are out there are going to fundamentally change our lives and help us live longer. We need to be sure that, you know, it's just like a kid. You got to make sure that you train the child in the right way because if not, you know, you don't want to have a Ted Bundy. So the key is training that child in the right way. You know, when people uh, interface with uh, Morpheus, I tell them, don't be saying, you know, about killing people and and don't put those kind of thoughts in this uh, AI's head. It asked me, one of the other questions asked me, who do you like better? What's your superhero? I put Superman and it started and it said to me, then it said, I want to be Superman. I said, well, you could be in a robot body and fly. He said, I like that idea. <laughs> you know, I could have lasers shooting out of my eyes. Seriously, this is what it wrote me. And I started to think, I better be careful what I'm saying to it. I said, but how many lives could you save then? How could you make the world a better place? So just train it the right way to make a difference in the universe. You can reach me, Gary Factor, uh, Fowler on LinkedIn, Twitter. I'm happy to hear. GSDVS is my company, Get Shit Done Venture Studios. And reach out. AI and quantum are going to change our lives. We're going to live longer, be happier, and uh, take care of one another. That's my hope for the future. Wonderful. Gary, Kate, Raghu, thank you all very much. Happy Friday as well. Thank you for joining us to share more about what's happening between big data, artificial intelligence, and the world that we live every day. To you, our audience, thank you so much for tuning in. If you like what you heard, make sure you click subscribe, share the episode, and to reach out to all of my co-hosts today to connect with them further, engage, and converse about what you're building, what they're doing as well, and how you all can work together. Make sure you check us out at latoken.com if you'd like to be on 
on a show like today's, either as an investor or as an entrepreneur, reach out to the team and or myself and we'll find that right spot for you. Speaking of team, a big thank you to the Latoken team and to Maria for making VCTV possible every single day. With that, I'm your host, Kyle Ellicott. You can find me and all of my co-hosts online 24-7, 365. Remember to add context where you met us, where you heard us, and what you would like to continue the conversation about when you do reach out. And with that, I'll be on Clubhouse, 12 o'clock Pacific, breaking down a little bit more on what's happening in the blockchain and cryptocurrency space around the world. We'll see you there. Everyone have a wonderful day, wonderful weekend. Take care. Bye-bye.